most people these days are, are wondering what's going on, right? The, we, you know, the famous word these days is kind of like human flourishing. You, you've heard that term. You know, you wonder, you, I pretty much have everything I need, certainly have that, and most of what I want. How come I'm still not feeling happy? Why are things like still not where I feel like they ought to be? And, and so that leads to other questions about identity. And, and if there's anything that we seek for these days, more than anything, is identity. It's almost become a religion kind of a thing, right? So, so we want to know, who am I? You know, in the midst of having everything and doing, you know, we can't figure out who in the world am I? And so, you know, a lot of, you know, people are living high on that, you know, trying to sell all kinds of good ways of figuring that out. And that's not necessarily an, a new thing, right? All the way back to uh, Hippocrates, right? About 400 years before Christ, uh, he's the one that, that uh, usually is called the father of medicine. They still, any kind of medical uh, profession will give the Hippocratic kind of oath when when they start. He also came up with kind of a four different kind of ways of, of thinking about who am I, right? And so you got the melancholy, the sanguine, the phlegmatic, and the choleric. And so, they, you know, we kind of divide people up like that. Then, of course, that is built on, and, you know, there are all kind of people that read more diligently in questions about Myers-Briggs and figure out, am I really an ENTB, you know, or what in the world that is, and, and then they kind of look at that, they study that, they read that, and they figure, i got to live into this because that seems like me, and I really would like to, I wish I was that, but you know, am I making sense that you hear me with all this, you know, or Enneagram, like I'm, I'm a six, wing two, you know, what, we really, really lean into that sometimes. Identity matters, and it really does matter. The Bible uses different language. The Bible sp talks about calling. And we, we're not using that language too much anymore, except maybe we have an intuitive kind of sense of what that means, right? Because we, we sense if someone is, is kind of called, uh, it's a different thing than just performing a job, right? If we say of something, you know, of someone that, that she's not just you know, doing this as her job. It's like her calling for her to be a teacher. It's like a calling to be a, a nurse, right? And, and sometimes you'll hear someone even on the, on the TV, they suddenly find out, oh, this is what I'm about. This really fills me with purpose and joy. And they use phrases like, I was placed on this planet for this. Are you hearing me? And, and I know we all kind of know this kind of thing. And, and, and sometimes... We throw ourselves into that, and the Bible is using the term calling to express some of that very sentiment that this is what you are about, is who you are. And let me begin this whole series by simply saying this, to be a Christian is a calling. Are you hearing me? To be a Christian is a calling. It, it is not just a conviction about certain kind of truth about Jesus, about the eternal life, about what the, you know, Christ did on the cross. It is a calling. It is a life-altering way of looking at what you are about. So when Jesus calls you to follow him, it is not just, you know, you got to make these decisions and have these kind of specific convictions in your mind, it is much deeper than that. Call has to do with purpose. Maybe I can say it this way. I was uh, 16 when I, I moved from just kind of living on my, my parents' faith. I grew up in, a, in an incredible Christian home. Uh, you know, where they had really kind of allowed me to know who Jesus was in the best way possible. They had not reduced Christianity to a moral code. They, they had not kind of given me all kinds of rigorous things. This is what you must do. They just allowed me to understand who Christ was and to live in his grace. And, and I was just fortunate with that. But it was not until I was 16 that I came to think, this 
needs to be mine. I need to hear a call, and I need to say yes to that call to live as his disciple. And so because, I, you know, out of high school and, and, you know, math and physics and science felt like logical, as you know, it makes sense. So I became an engineer, still called to be a Christian. This was my purpose. This is my focus of life. And, and then I was struggling with, with kind of a more specific kind of call. You know, they kept eating at me on the inside. I, I needed to figure out, you know, what is God saying? More than just I want you to be a Christian, I want you in a specific kind of role in my kingdom. And so I became a pastor. I went back to school, became a pastor. Then, then you know, as, as I went on, I still kind of yearned for, for a kind of a deeper level of, of research. And, and, and so I became a, a you know, study a research PhD and, and became a professor and, and still sense this call to always preach. And now I'm training preachers. I'm saying all this to say, call never changed. Vocation changed. The position I had changed. The platform from which I could live out my call changed. But the call didn't change. Are you seeing the difference? The distinction between like a job and a calling, between, between like a vocation and a calling. And I think this is what we see here. God's Word talks about being called all the time. Israel, God's people were called. The prophets were called in the New Testament. Every single follower of Jesus is called. They're chosen. So the question is, what does that mean for us today when we sit here? Collin County, City of Allen, First Baptist Church. What does this mean? How do we move beyond this just being words? You know, if, if you hold on to this notion that a calling is what sets people's major kind of purpose in life, and understand that life changes, circumstances changes, job changes, all of these other things changes, but the call does not. Who you are in Christ does not. He calls you, and it will change your life. And we know, if we know anything, and that's why I always invite you to talk to your neighbor, talk to your friends, talk to your workmen, bring them here, and bring them to your own living rooms, and pray with them, and talk to them, right? Because people without a sense of purpose, that is, without a calling, become rootless, and things become difficult. And so I'm going to read with you a text that speaks to that from Luke chapter 6. And some of you, when I'm done reading, are thinking, I wonder what in the world it's going to say about that. So verse 12 in chapter 6. During those days, Jesus went out to the mountain to pray, and he spent all night in prayer to God. When the daylight came, he summoned his disciples, and he chose 12 of them, whom he also named apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother James, and John, Philip, and Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. You know, I wonder sometimes, what do you hear when you hear this? Right? So I think sometimes in our minds, we simply have this notion that then here they are doing all this stuff, whatever their jobs were, attending to their job, and, and here comes this stranger, his name is Jesus, walking by and say, hey, follow me. And they said, okay, and they dropped everything they had and just followed him. This stranger they never met before. That's probably not what happened. 
Surely they had heard of his reputations, you know, these little villages. The word was out. Some of them might have seen, most likely have seen him do extraordinary things, whether he had opened the eyes of a blind person or, or, or helped, you know, or healed a lame person or a paralyzed person to, to walk. You know, the, the word was out, and now this person came, and then when they saw him face to face, they, are no, they knew intuitively, here is more something more important than just me. And when they heard his call, they changed. And they said, yes, we will follow. Here's something that would be more important in terms of the purpose of my life than what I'm just doing now. So what happens to you when Jesus meets with you and he places a call before you. You've heard of his reputation. You know of what he's done. You, you've seen other people be, be changed or, or you know certainly that you need to have this touch of Christ. What are you going to do now that someone, someone who is none other than the son of the living God, the creator of heaven and earth, says, would you come and follow me? To place a call on your life that your call now is to follow Jesus. You know, certainly it can't be, it can't be lost on all of us, right, that, that this call will change everything, and it did, of course, from, from these Disciple Peter heard him say, you are, are now a fisherman, but I'm going to turn you into a fisherman, of, a fisher of men. Everything changed. And, and that's just how it works. It can't be lost on us that, that he called 12. It, it, it corresponds directly, of course, and many of you will know that, right, to, to the 12 tribes of Israel. So he's not just calling individuals as such. He is creating a new community, a new way of living together, a new way of understanding what, what life is all about, a new way of experiencing God's presence together. And as you see that, you realize also, we're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks, you, you see also that, that this new people, right? The, the 12 is being replaced by a, another 12, so to speak, and, and this new people is being formed as God's people, and is centered not, about, not around ethnicity, all being sons of Abraham in that sense, but around testimony. When, G, when Peter later on says to Jesus, you are the son of the living God, Jesus said, on that I will build my church. That's the calling to live out. Common purpose. You know, we all, if you're like me anyway, some words are just too churchy. Right? I mean, they, they just feel churchy. They, they feel old. They feel not like my every day. And, and call and, and being Elected kind of goes with that. What does it mean to be called by God? It speaks to who we are, as I already mentioned. But let's kind of walk through just a little bit in, in, the, in, the, uh, in Scripture to see what is there, right? God has called a people, and if you study just the slightest in Scripture, you'll realize that, that all of his calling is wrapped in this covenant relationship that he has with the people, a whole people who were designed now to make God's name known among the nations. It was a call. They were chosen, if you will, called to be that people, and not just a bunch of individuals coming together, but a people with a purpose that, of course, shines into the individual who is part 
of that group. I, I want you to see and hear directly, and I'm going to read it. I could have just quoted it, but I want you to hear it verbatim as, as it comes here, right? And in Isaiah 42, verse 6, when, when this call is clarified, this purpose of God's calling, this covenantal relationship, he said, I am the Lord. I have called you for a purpose that is a righteous purpose. That means a purpose that comes from his throne, of course. And I will hold you by your hand. I will watch over you. I will appoint you. I will appoint you to be a covenant people. What is that? A light unto the nations. Why? In order to open blind eyes and bring prisoners out of captivity. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Everything changes. There's a new purpose, a new call. Now look, who's the first that had been called? The great callings in Scripture, of course, begins with Abraham. We know that, and the call came to Abraham uh, as, as a kind of command to Abraham to leave where you are, all this stuff that you're in the middle of, and go to this new place and create a new home and, and a new atmosphere and, and new kind of people, if you will. Start a new life. Why? What's the purpose? Well, God says in Genesis chapter 12, right after the Babylon, I mean, right after the Tower of Babel, where everything became just about themselves, and we're just doing what we like, and we're going to build this great thing for ourselves, and they were scattered, and they did nothing but destroy their fellowship. And then, next chapter, God calls Abraham and says, you are to be a blessing to all the nations. Every generation after you will be blessed through you. Just read about it. That is, he's to bring God's presence to his surrounding. He's to change the effect of the fall. He is there to let people know about God who loves them. He's to restore a clear awareness of the covenant that God has made with his creation. Are you hearing this? That is purpose. He's called the father of faith. But think about this as, as, as illustrative or as a typology, if you will, of how it works. Even in your own life and in your own family, in your own community. That faith flows from faithfulness to the next generation and to the next generation, to friends everywhere. And you see what follows his son Isaac that came as a promise. God speaks directly to him and says, I will confirm the call I gave your father Abraham. Why? Let me just quote again. It's, it's chapter 25 of Genesis, or 26 of Genesis. Because Abraham obeyed my word and kept my requirements. In other words, he was a witness to the presence and the goodness of God. He was a witness and a testimony to the character of God called to live out the presence of God. Purpose. And, and then you see it, it goes on again, and, 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 and Isaac, his son Jacob, God meets with Jacob, and he says, in your seed, all the generations of the earth shall be blessed. God's purpose continues from generation to generation to generation. You're thinking, what, what happens after that? Well, as the story goes, one of Jacob's sons you know, become a prime minister in, in Egypt, and, and after a while, all God's people get there, and, and it's all good until they all turn into slaves. And then what? Had God forgotten his promise? No. They cried out, and what it says, God raised up Moses. 
And he places Moses in front of a burning bush. And he speaks, and listen to what he says. He says, I am the father of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Go and get my people out of their captivity. In other words, I call you, Moses, to be my tool to hear this call. People are stuck in their ways. They're stuck in their habits. They're stuck in their family patterns, and if you will. They're, they're captive, held captive by their personal demons. Bring them out, and I'll show you a way. And then you say, well, what happens after? Well, the next generation again, Joshua comes up. And the exact same thing is happening. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give, lead this people to inherit the land that I promised the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and those who follow. A new land, a new hope, a new presence, a purpose that is very clear. You shall be a light unto the nation. And some of you may be thinking, uh, you know, this is just uh, all the leaders. He calls the right leaders. And there's some, a lot to be said about that in the Old Testament, none the least. But let me show you here how this goes to everybody. You know, in, in chapter 35 of Exodus, incredible detail here. They're out in the desert now, outside, out of Egypt, and and they're there to bring offerings to God. And then they say here, verse 21, everyone, listen to how many times there's an everyone here. Everyone whose heart was moved and whose spirit prompted uh, him came and brought an offering to the Lord. Both men and women came, all who had willing hearts, brought whatever they had. Everyone who possessed something, right? And I, I can read long. Everyone again, verse 24, so verse 23, everyone who possessed blue and purple and scarlet and yarn all. And verse 24, everyone making an offering of silver and bronze. Everyone who possessed this and that. Everyone with skill. Everyone with this. Again in verse 25, everyone was skilled to bring this and that and, and the other. Verse 26, all the women whose heart were moved, spun. And in, in verse 29 again, so Israel had bought a free will offering and every man, every woman whose heart was prompted brought something to the Lord. This is a call for everyone, not just a few leaders. It's a purpose. It's an identity marker. It's who we are. Everyone who felt God's presence in any kind of real way brought what they had to live out this call. Other calls that we may have in our lives, all other kind of things that we do are subsumed or subordinated to this overarching call. Even those who didn't have a specific call, they saw the overarching call that God had placed on everyone he has called. It is as if David is kind of expressing that when he sings that unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers build and um, work in vain. Just think of this. I really don't want to just speak, friends. This is major. Something God can do. Just look around and think, what if that gripped us with power? You know, like I say, I was in the sanctuary, and he says, Lord, here I am, just send me. Jeremiah, who was fighting God, I don't want to do what you're telling me. And then he realized that even from the, before his birth, in his mother's womb already, he was called to be that person. Samuel, running around as a boy in the timber courts and hearing God's call. You know, God's call comes to 
different people at different times and different ways. But the call is not different. This is who I need you to be. If you're struggling with identity, here it is, friends. God called you to be his, and there's a purpose that comes with that. In the New Testament, of course, there are all kinds of new dimensions on that. The very content of the call comes directly to the individual to participate in, in this, right? And again, all kinds of language like we have, right? You are, you are called to a new hope in Christ. You are called to find peace in Christ. You're called to follow Christ. You're called to a fellowship with Christ. You're called to receive eternal life from Christ. All of these things, not different calls, but different aspects. It's like you hold a diamond in your hand. And, and you see incredible beauty, color, and depth, and you turn it just a little bit, the same diamond, and you see new colors and new depths and new beauty, and you turn it again. That's kind of how the call also works. So much language to express this purpose and the reality of this. So the question is, if you're willing, friend, to see the Christian face, your Christian Yes to Jesus. Not as a, yes, I have these beliefs in my brain. Yes, I hope to go to heaven. Or I know I will go to heaven when I die. But a call to see, here's my purpose. This is what God aims for me to be about. Not just carry a name, but live a life. And you may say, well, I know this is Bible, but I ain't no Simon Peter. I'm not John. I'm not a disciple that the Bible says Jesus loved. I'm just me, and I flat struggle with life as it is. Well, if that's your point, look at who Jesus called. Boy, talking about monthly crew. You get, you get Simon and, and Andrew. Well, Andreas is his real name. is like my son. Sorry about that. But you look at, at Simon and Andrew, two fishermen. One was kind of outgoing, kind of rude, kind of rough, kind of unrefined, unpolished. The other one was quiet, cautious. Not ever about himself unless he's called out. Then you got James and John again. They're fishermen, and they're kind of, they're, you know, they're very, I don't even know how to say that. Aggressive may be the word, right? And one time they were in a place, and people didn't want to listen to them. They, they just want to call hell and brimstone out, down on people. And then at another time, they, they sit with Jesus, as the disciples do, and they said, hey, Lord, would you give us the right and the left seat next to you when we get to glory? What do you think these other disciples were thinking? <laughs> you fool, right? I mean, what do you think? Matthew and Simon the Zealot, one was a traitor, working for the people who occupied them, taking money from his own people. And then, a member of the resistance, the underground kind of resistance movement, who would rather see people like Matthew dead. And then you got Philip. And you got Judas, the son of James. They're kind of dense. Are you the one to come? Or should someone else come? How do we know that you are the right one? Are you not getting it? And then you got Bartholomew uh, or Nathaniel, uh, same person, and, and, and Thomas. They're skeptics. Nathaniel saying, is, is there anything good ever coming out of Nazareth? And Thomas, we know, is saying, yeah, I don't trust that he was risen, that he's risen until I see him. And then you get Judas Iscariot, the traitor, and James and both of them are kind of known for negative things, right? One is a traitor. The other one is called the little 
kind of distinguish him. How do you know this James from that James? Well, he's a little. So the real question is never, who are you? The real question is always, who do you think Jesus can make you to become? Yes? That's the point. The calling will change who you are. And nothing about these guys that was worth mentioning much about. It's always about who do you want to be. The possibility of purpose and of following. And it's not like an add-on. It's in the name. You are called by Christ to follow him. And then I'm going to round up here. I uh, see time is flying. Um, but if you begin this, what we just read from in, in, uh, in Luke chapter 6, right? It all began with Jesus had been praying all night. He's praying for you, friends. He did that every time. So when you read through just the Gospel of Luke, right in chapter 3, before he was baptized, he was praying all night. See that, right? Before the first conflicts, chapter 5, with all the Pharisees, Jesus is praying. Here before he calls his disciples, he's praying. Before Peter's great confession that we'll get to in a couple of Sundays, he is praying. Before his suffering, he is praying. We can go on and on. And what does he say in John chapter 17? He says, Lord, I pray not only for these, but I pray for those who through their testimony, that is those who sit at First Baptist Church in Allen in 2024, that they would hear this. What are you saying? You can look it up. John 17. He is right there. Not only for these, but those who, from their testimony. And that goes on as we started from generation to generation. We need you to touch our hearts. We need you to move us. Not just letting us go from here and knowing that what we heard comes from Scripture but to be moved in the depths of our souls, to hear our call from you. When we say Jesus is Lord, that we recognize that the strength to live this out comes from you, even as we seek you to understand in particular what does that mean in my life? How does that put everything else in perspective? Lord, I ask for everyone here and everyone who's listening from someplace else or watching. Speak to them directly, Lord. Let them know that you have called. Forgive us when we take it lightly, when it becomes nothing other than a conviction about some great things that you have done for us and not this clarifying, purpose-filled understanding of life. Well, we are grateful that you said, come follow me. And we want to do that, even in a way for everyone around here knows that we have found our purpose in Christ and that they can too. Amen and amen.